tuning in to the second night of the virtual gospel revival meeting of the Sugarland Church of Christ. For those who are members of the Sugarland Church of Christ and uh, members of the Lord's Church throughout the nation and international, it's our hope and prayer that you will be uh, encouraged by the gospel message tonight by Minister Lamont Ross of the Mercedes Avenue Church of Christ, Dallas, Texas, and that your faith will be strengthened. 
To those of you who are our guests, we are delighted that you have uh, tuned in to our virtual revival. It's our prayer that you will be uh, spiritually enlightened by tonight's message and the word of God will draw you closer to his will for your life. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our Father, my God, we just thank you so much for this day and this opportunity, Father, for us to come together to share another portion of your word. Father, we just ask a special prayer upon uh, uh, Brother Ross as he come to us to this evening. Pray that you would com continue to bless him and give him strength, Father, give him the knowledge and wisdom and understanding that he needs, Father, that he might uh, share your word with us in a way that everyone may understand what they must do in order to be saved. Father, we thank you so much for the Sugarland congregation and the leadership here at the congregation and the work that they've done to uh, put on such a revival as this. We just pray that we would, uh, the word that's shared would be something that will help us to be stronger Christians in the future than we ever dared be in the past. We ask that you would be with us as we go through this service this evening. Uh, these are all blessings, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All night and it's all day, you know the angel watch it over, my Lord. I'm singing all night and it's all day, angel watch it over me. I'm going through the valley one day to pray and the angel watch it over, my Lord. And my soul got happy and I stayed all day you know the angel watches over all night now all day i've got an angel watching over me my lord i'm singing up all night and all an angel watching over well well and if you get there before i do the angel watch it over me my lord tell all of my friends i'm coming home to the angel watch it over me all night now and it wonderful to have an angel i'm glad about it and all night long and all I Every now and then my heart gets blue, the angel watches over me, my Lord. But I call on Jesus and he sees me through, the angel watches over. They're watching all night, all night long, and it's so all day, the angel I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad. Oh, Night and it's all oh, angel watches over all night now. Wonderful, all day the angel is watching over my, 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 my Lord all night and it's all angels watching over angels, angels watching over. Over me. Okay, we're here this evening to uh, uh, introduce the speaker for this evening, Brother William Lamont Ross. Uh, Lamont Ross has been a senior minister of the Mercedes Avenue Church of Christ in Dallas, Texas since uh, January 2015. Prior to that, he served as uh, seven years as a congregational family and youth minister and uh, was a youth minister at the East Side Church of Christ in Austin, Texas uh, for six years. He holds a master's in art and theology, studies from the Austin Graduate School of Theology and a master's in professional counseling. He graduated with honors from the University of Texas at Austin uh, with a bachelor's of science in communication studies. Brother Ross uh, has been preaching since the age of 17 and has uh, been a featured speaker at lectureships, marriage seminars, single workshops, uh, youth conferences, and the various uh, church community and corporate events. He is a licensed professional counselor and is a, 
a seminar, a seminar director with the Prepared Enriched Training Church and Training Church Leaders and Counselors How to Minister to Couples. He and his wife, Stacy, has uh, three children. After another song, the next voice you hear will be Brother Lamont Ross, Senior Minister of the Mercedes Avenue Church of Christ, Dallas, Texas. Thank you. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me. Oh, and then a little light from heaven filled my, my soul. My soul, it bathed my heart and love and wrote my name. You know that just a little talk with Jesus makes me whole. Now let us. When you fit a little prayerful as your mind to heaven is turning, you will find a talk with Jesus makes it all right. Sometimes my path seems drear without a real cheer, and then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day. day. The mist of sin may rise hide the starry skies but just a little talk with Jesus is the way come on and let us have a little everybody ought to tell him all about your trouble he will hear I believe he'll answer by and by now when you feel as your heart to heaven is I know you'll find the talk with Jesus makes it all right. And I may have doubts and sometimes my eyes are filled with tears. But Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. All night I go to him and I'm glad he knows my every. Oh, and just a little talk with Jesus makes it all right now let us every child of God ought to tell him about your trouble he will hear our faintest and I believe he will answer by right now when you fail here's your heart under heaven is turning you will find a talk with the master makes it and come on come on and let Everybody ought to tell him all about joy. He will hear. I know he will ask. God bless you. Jesus, you'll find a talk with Jesus. Fix it. Good evening, brothers and sisters of the Sugar Land Church of Christ and all of those who are joining us for this revival. I bring you greetings from the Marcellus Avenue Church of Christ in Dallas, Texas, where it's my privilege to serve as the minister. I want to thank Minister Parker for the invitation to be a part of this great revival. And it's my prayer that this revival will do what it's intended to do, uh, to encourage, to strengthen, to refresh, renew and revive the people of God. Uh, this evening, we are in Exodus chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3, and we'll be looking at verses 7 through 12. Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. Hear the word of the Lord on this evening. The Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen 
the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. As you all have for the theme of your revival, perceiving God's presence in perilous times. I want to talk to you on the subject, God's purpose in peril. God's purpose in peril. A crisis will make you cry out. A crisis will make you cry out. It seems that hardwired into the psyche of humanity is the response of crying out in the midst of crisis. From Genesis to Revelation, from Adam to us, the crisis response of people everywhere is to cry out. And when we get to the book of Exodus, we find a people who are crying out. Well, well how did they get there? Well, generations earlier, uh, when Joseph was second in command in Egypt, uh, Jacob, uh, his sons, and their families moved to Egypt at the request of Pharaoh to escape the great famine. And as time went on, their families grew larger and, and larger and became more numerous than the Egyptians. And eventually, uh, there was a new king who was crowned in Egypt, and that king did not know Joseph. He did not know what Joseph had done for Egypt. That king, that Pharaoh, decided to enslave the descendants of Jacob, also known as Israel. So the descendants of Israel find themselves in Egypt as a people with a large population, yet no power. They are being enslaved. They are oppressed, abused by the Egyptians. And after years of slavery and mistreatment, after years even of genocide, the children of Israel cry out for help. Meanwhile, about 200 miles or so away in Midian, there's a former Egyptian royal turned fugitive by the name of Moses, who is shepherding his father-in-law's flock. And as Moses is searching for a place for the flock to graze, he finds himself leading them to Horeb or to Sinai, the mountain of God. And there he, he notices while he's at Sinai, while he's at this mountain of God, he notices that a bush is burning, but it's not being burnt up. Uh, and so, as is natural, he is intrigued by this unique sight, and, and uh, he looks a little bit closer. And as he uh, looks more closely at this bush that is burning, God calls his name from the bush, Moses, Moses. And, and Moses says, here I am. And God says, don't come near. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then God says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God introduces himself to Moses, introduces himself first as the God of Moses's father. It's a connection to Moses's heritage. And then God says, uh, there is a connection to the patriarchs. I'm the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So after God introduces himself to Moses, God then speaks a word of deliverance, which, which brings us to Exodus chapter 3, uh, verses 7 through 9. Uh, there, the Lord said, I've surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. 
for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Uh, God says, I've heard the cry, and I've seen the pain of my people. Now, this is the first time in Scripture that God calls the children of Israel his people. Notice what God says. I have surely seen the affliction of my people. Uh, sometimes we wonder if God sees us. Uh, we wonder if, if he's paying any attention to us. Uh, but you can be confident that God sees your condition. Your pain has not gone unnoticed by God. God sees the affliction of his people and God responds based upon what he sees. God says, surely, surely I've seen. Don't you think for a minute that God doesn't see you. Uh, then uh, God says, I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. God sees and God hears. He, he sees and he hears. God does not just hear our cry, but God knows why we are crying. He, he knew that the Israelites were crying because of the harsh conditions they were enduring under the hand of the Egyptians. God knows why you're crying. Every sigh, every tear that you cry, God knows the why behind your tears. God says, I see, I hear, and I know about your sufferings. God is intimately knowledgeable about what his people are experiencing. God knows what his people are going through. God hears, God sees. He doesn't just see you. He sees what others are doing to you. Uh, God sees the injustice. He, he sees your hurt. He sees your pain. And as the God who is abounding in compassion, God is moved to action. God always responds to what he sees, hears, and knows. Uh, God says, I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land, from that land to a good and spacious land. God says, I I've come down to, to bring them up. There, there, there was something that God was saving them from. He was saving them from their slavery in Egypt. He was delivering them from the house of bondage. God was saving them from something, but there was also something God was saving them to. Uh, he was saving them to the promised land. And the promised land, it was a fertile land. It was a good land. It was a large land and a spacious land land. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. What does that mean? It was a place where there was enough resources to sustain the children of Israel. It was a land that was spacious enough to accommodate this growing population. They would not encounter the problems that they had in Egypt where the Egyptians felt like they were getting too large. There, there were six nations who occupied this land. So God said, I'm going to give you a land that's big enough, not just for your now, but for your later. I'm going to bless you so that when you grow, you'll still be able to thrive in the land. God says, I'm going to come down. God came down and, and we know that God is everywhere. Uh, God really did not have to come down, but in order to help us as his people, as humans understand the movement and the actions of God, he speaks to us in a way that we can comprehend. So God says, I've come down, I I'll come down. 
God came down to bring them out and to bring them up. Uh, he, he came down to bring them out of Egypt and bring them up to the promised land. Uh, I thought I'd let you know that when God delivers you, the place that he brings you to is always better than the place that he brought you from. Uh, let me say that again. When God delivers you, the place he brings you to is always better than the place he brought you from. In other words, God brings us out to bring us up. Uh, he, he delivers you so that he can elevate you. Uh, I know you see this as an illusion to heaven. The, the place where we are going is better than the place where we are. For the place where we are, it is a place of sadness and sorrow. It is a place of sickness and sin. It's a place of death and dying. It's a place of pain and problems. The place where we are is a hard place, but the place where we're going is a place of rest and Reward. It's a place of peace and joy, a place of healing and happiness. It's a place of no more, no more sickness, no more death, no more hatred, no more worries, no more mass shooting, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more hospitals, no more doctor's visits, no more bad news. It's a place of no more. The place where God is taking us to is infinitely better than the place he's bringing us from. Don't think God has forgotten about you. Uh, he knows your address. Uh, he knows your name. God knows your situation. And, and while we anticipate being brought up to heaven, praise God for some deliverance on this side of eternity. God doesn't bring you out to leave you stuck out. When God brings you from something, he brings you up to something greater. Oh, somebody can testify. The Lord didn't just bring me out. He brought me up. Uh, he brought me out of the world and I'm glad he brought me out, but I'm, I'm especially glad he brought me up into the church. When the Lord brings you out, he brings you up. He brought me out of a bad job or no job at all and brought me up into my dream job. When he brings you out, he brings you up. He brought me out of a dysfunctional relationship and brought me up into a healthy one. He's the God of elevation and the God of the upgrade. When he brings you out, he brings you up. He brought me out of sickness and brought me up into good health. He brought me out of chaos and confusion in my home and brought me up into harmony and stability. He brought me out of my bad attitude. He brought me out of hatred. My, brought me out of envy, brought me out of anger, brought me out of my sin, and brought me up into love. He brought me up into joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I'm so glad that when he brought me out, he created in me a clean heart and renewed a right spirit within me. He didn't just bring me out, he brought me up. Now, 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 now watch. Watch what God says, verses 10 through 12, Exodus chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. And he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Moses, because I've heard because I've seen, because I know, God says, 
I'm going to send you to bring my people out of Egypt. And Moses is like, Lord, who am I? Uh, Moses, Moses missed it. God is going to use Moses. Uh, the work was not going to be all on Moses. God says, certainly I will be with you. Make no mistake about it. I will be with you. Uh, God earlier said, I'm going to deliver them. But here in verse 10, God turns to Moses and said, I'm going to send you and you will bring my people out. What's the point? God uses people to accomplish his purpose. Uh, yeah, God uses people. He uses you and I to accomplish his purpose. And God's purpose is always bigger than one person. Uh, if your purpose is just about you, then you have the wrong purpose. Uh, God, God wants to use you to be a blessing to others. God's purpose for you uh, may be in response to someone else's cry. God heard the cry of Israel, yet he sent Moses, and in the cry of Israel, Moses found his purpose. God's purpose for you may be connected to what he's seen and heard in the lives of others. Moses, I'm going to send you back to Egypt. Moses, I know you tried to help the Hebrews before. And in you responding in your anger to the oppression that you saw, you ended up killing an Egyptian and you had to flee Egypt. But Moses, I'm going to send you back to the place that you ran from. But this time, Moses, when you go back, you'll be successful because I'm going to work through you to deliver Israel. I thought I'd let you know that God will sometimes send us back to the place of our failure with a new purpose and a new plan. Yes, we, we've been there before, but, but, but God will often send us back to the place of our failure with a new purpose and a new plan. God is with us time and time again. God shows us that failure is not final. God is able to redeem our failures. God tells Moses, I'm going to give you a sign. The sign is going to let you know that I'm the one who sent you. What's that sign? When you bring the people out of Egypt, y'all will worship God on this mountain. God says to Moses, I'm sending you and I'll be with you, but I'm going to give you a sign that I'm the one that sent you. Uh, this very place where we're having this conversation, Moses, you and the people of Israel will worship God on this mountain. This is significant because it not only meant the movement of Israel from one place to another, but it also meant the movement of the people from one faith to another. See, when, when Israel initially cried out, the Bible does not say that they cried out to God. It says that they cried out and God saw, God heard, and God knew their suffering. So, so it's questionable when they cried out if they actually knew who they were crying to. And so what God does, God introduces himself to Moses so that Moses can introduce God to the children of Israel. Uh, if God is going to be known, it's because those who know him introduce him to those who don't. I, I thought I would let you know that if the next generation is going to have faith, it's because those of this generation have introduced them to the God of heaven. They're not going to figure it out on their own, even if they cry out. They may just be crying out to a higher power. They may be crying out to the universe. They may be crying out to some 
false God. So it's incumbent upon us, those who know God, to introduce God to those who don't know him. So God says that the people would get to Sinai. But more importantly, they would be delivered from the false gods of Egypt and would come to trust the one true living God. Notice there was a period of time between the crying out and the deliverance. Yet God was not absent during this waiting period. God was strengthening them to endure while they, they waited on their deliverance. See, during the waiting period, God is still active. He's still moving. He's still working. God strengthens us to endure the suffering until deliverance comes. Notice this. The sign that God gives Moses can only be realized after Moses completes his assignment. The sign that God gives Moses can only be realized after Moses completes his assignment. For Moses, confirmation would not come until after the assignment was completed. So Moses asked for a sign and he wants confirmation, but that confirmation would come after the assignment was completed. See, we, we tend to want confirmation before we accept the assignment. Uh, we tend to want God to move first before we move, but, but that's not the way that God works. We, we often want to have every question answered, every potential problem already solved, every detail worked out before we move. But God says, I've already given you my word that I'm with you, and now it's time for you to embrace the assignment that I have for you. And when you are successful, then you will see that I'm the one who gave you the assignment. I want you to step out on faith and accept the assignment because I've already told you that I'm with you and you will know that it's me while you are on assignment because I'm going to move in your life and I'm going to bring you to the place that I promise you, but you need to move and operate in your purpose. You need to accept the assignment and complete the assignment first. And while you are on assignment, you will defeat giants. While you are on assignment, you will experience divine power. While you are on assignment, you will see that God has the power to make a way out of no way, but you have to accept the assignment first. While on assignment, you will see that God is able to give you bread from heaven and water in a desert. You'll see that God is able to open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so much that you cannot receive it. You'll see that God is providing for you and protecting you. God has an assignment for you, but you must be willing to accept the assignment. And God says, once you've accepted the assignment, I will let you know that I'm the one who's been with you all along. The Lord has a purpose for your life, even in perilous times. The God who saves is also the God who sins. He sends us into the world. He, he saves us from the world and then sends us back into the world. The God who saves is also the God who sins. Every follower of Christ is first called to salvation and then to service. We're called to salvation and then we're called to service. Each of us is called to serve the God who sees, the God who hears, and the God who knows. Whether we are preachers, or accountants, whether we're school teachers, retirees, homemakers, or corporate executives, God has work for us to do. God is calling us, and God uses us. Uh, he, he uses us like he used Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all had their, flaw, their faults, their flaws, and their failures, yet God uses used them and God used Moses. Moses 
had killed a man, but God used him. God uses us with all of our faults, all of our flaws, all our failures. Just as he used Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, just as he used Moses, God uses fallible humanity to accomplish his saving purpose. Thank God for using us in spite of us. Thank God for saving us and then sending us out for his purpose. If you're not part of the family of God, there is a place for you in God's family. There's not only a place for you, but there is a purpose for you. God is sending you out. God wants you to be his. God wants you to find your purpose in who he is. If you have not obeyed the gospel, why don't you make that decision to obey the gospel today? If you believe Jesus to be the son of God, repent of your sins, confess Jesus as Lord, and you can be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. You can connect with the Sugar Land Church of Christ. And even if you're not in the Sugar Land, Houston area, they can connect you with the body of Christ wherever you are so that you can complete your obedience to the gospel. For God has a purpose for your life in perilous times. And that purpose is not separate and apart from the body of Christ is not separate and apart from salvation. The God who saves is the God who sins. So if you wish to be saved, we encourage you again to connect with Sugarland Church of Christ. I hope that this message has been a blessing to you. Again, thankful for the invitation to share with you during this revival. God bless you. God strengthen you. May God continue to ever be with the work that is being done there in the Sugarland area. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to Saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh. Trust him more and Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace. Brother Lamont Ross, what a powerful message. Brother Lamont Ross of Marcellus Avenue in Dallas, Texas. Thank you so much for, for, for accepting our invitation to be with us on this gospel series. We hope, trust, and pray that everybody was edified tonight. I know I certainly was. And, and the theme of this entire uh, series is perceiving God's presence in perilous times. And Brother Lamont Ross certainly reminded us that even in today's times, God is still present. He is still with us. So thank you so much for your message, Brother Ross. Please tune in tomorrow night, our listening audience. We have Brother Randall Tucker of the South Union Church of Christ here in Houston, Texas. And his topic is God's promise in pearl. And so these series of messages were, were, again, were put together to show us that God is still present, even in the perilous times that we're living in today. So thank you so much for listening, tuning in with us tonight. We hope, trust, and pray that you also tune in with us tomorrow night also. Uh, I'm Brother Lewis Parker. Hope to see you there. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank you for tuning in to our virtual gospel meeting tonight, this Wednesday night, as 
Brother Randall Tucker did a great job on God's promise in prayer. Well, thank you for being a part of that. And if there's uh, any questions, you can contact uh, any of us here at the church and we can be more than happy to give you a Bible answer for a Bible question. Uh, at this time, we're going to go ahead and have our closing prayer. Let us together pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this privilege and opportunity to hear your word preached. Thank you for your manservant and for the great job he did in holding fast your word. We ask your blessing upon each of us as we uh, take in what has been said from your word that it might inspire us to be better servants in your kingdom. Help us, dear God, to be your people and to continue to be a beacon in a dying world that we use what we heard tonight to always bring glory and honor to your holy and righteous name. We thank you. We ask your blessing upon each of us. In Jesus' name do we pray. Amen.